Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Future in Space Hangout. This is your place to come to chat with experts in the fields of astronautics about all kinds of really cool topics. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and here in these Hangouts, we discuss, discuss everything from the technologies and the vehicles to get humans into space to the complicated space platforms that give us views of the universe we've never before seen. Now, today's topic is about the increasing role robotics is playing in space endeavors. No one is any longer surprised at the number of sophisticated robots that you could see in a modern factory, such as cars and things like that. But many people might be surprised at how robots are becoming an attractive option for complex operations in space, which include things like construction, servicing, and the rescuing of satellites. I mean, can anybody say, let's rescue Hubble? <laughs> that's one That's one on my list anyway. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I want to thank the American Astronautical Society for sponsoring and endorsing these Hangouts uh, because they're, it allows their membership to help raise awareness about what they're doing in the exciting field of astronautics. And these Hangouts are also endorsed by the American Astronomical Society. And I want to welcome everyone watching us live as well as those who are watching us after the stream is over uh, because regardless of how you're watching, Watching. We hope you'll give us some questions and comments uh, because this will be your chance to interact with experts in the field. They're here for you guys. So you can interact with us by using the live chat on YouTube or you can use the Deep Astronomy Discord server. Uh, the link to that is down in the description box below uh, in this video. And finally, I just want to say if you like these videos, please help us out by giving us a thumbs up or sharing the video with someone that you think might like to see it because doing that really helps us grow our audience uh, to reach those who might otherwise know about these things. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Let me pull up my uh, my guests here. Uh, joining me uh, is, is my co-host down in the lower left panel there is uh, Dr. Harley Thronson from, the, uh, from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Hi, Harley. Hey, good afternoon or morning or whenever folks are watching us. Always good to join you. Yep. And uh, you want to give a little background on what we're doing with these Hangouts? Sure. We're in for a real treat today. I think your your background, your introduction was, was excellent. Nobody is surprised to learn about uh, in modern factories of all kinds, robotic systems and so on, even increasingly around the house. Uh, but the same, uh, some of the same techniques and some and many even more advanced techniques are more and more being applied to space operations. And eventually, as our speakers are going to, or as our guests are going to be talking about today, um, space servicing and space assembly. We've got robots on Mars, of course, well known, um, but uh, robots in free space. Um, either Shao or I guess, either Shao or Al will make the point, I might as well make it now, that as astronomers are designing or and one day hoping to build increasingly large aperture observatories, increasingly large telescopes. They are the designs, the concepts are becoming too large for the available launch vehicles. And folks, including our guests, are looking more and more at the possibilities of assembly of space telescopes and um, and other facilities in space, about which we're about ready to hear a great deal more. Okay, uh, let me. I'll go ahead and introduce our guests. Um, I got the uh, the four shot up here. Uh, my, my in the upper right next to me is uh, is is Shao Smith. She's from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, hi, Shao. You want to introduce uh, where you work at NASA? Oh, absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shao Smith, and I'm at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, my division is the Satellite Servicing Projects uh, Division. Uh, we are advancing the groundbreaking technologies that enable satellite servicing, exploration, and science. Oh, good. Thank you. And also joining me is uh, Al Tadros from SSL. Al is joining us on the phone. He doesn't have video, so he's the, he gets the... Uh, he gets the little thumbnail <laughs> that I sent out as a, as a representative of him. Hi, Al. Welcome. I think, I think, I, I think Al asked us to put up a picture of Brad Pitt in his place. <laughs> oh, did that what that was? I didn't get that. Okay. That, that, that's right. George Clooney or Brad Pitt would work. Yeah. So, uh, well, hello, so hello, everyone. Hello, <laughs> hello, hello, everyone. And I'm excited to be here. Uh, this is a, a very interesting topic and um, one that's very timely. Um, I, uh, as uh, the introduction said, uh, you know, I am from SSL in Palo Alto, California, and uh, we build space systems uh, as well as uh, robotics for uh, space systems. Uh, we, our corporation 
is Maxar Technologies, and uh, the business units include MDA in Canada, where they built uh, for Canadian Space Agency the robotic arms on shuttle and uh, and space station, the Canada arms, and uh, our uh, group in uh, Pasadena, uh, SSL Robotics, uh, has built the robotic arms on many of the Mars landers and rovers. Uh, just the last one was launched on InSight uh, just about a month ago, uh, heading to Mars. Uh, and it'd be, I'm looking forward to talking about where robotics and space are going uh, from here. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Uh, so let's, but before we go to where we're going, let's talk about a little bit about where we've been. You want to do that? Um, maybe Xiao, can you give us a little bit of a background on, on sort of the historic, uh, use places where you're working and the, th- the things that, uh, have happened historically with this field of robotics? Oh, um, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, one good example is, um, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope, right? So many, I think many of the people have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, and it's actually a shiny example of the um, benefit of servicing. So, um, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope, one of the most productive scientific machine in history. Uh, the telescope was originally supposed to have a lifespan, lifespan of 10 years. Um, but because of its five successful servicing missions, NASA was able to fix the telescope when needed and upgrade the technology and instruments to, you know, keep up with the pace of time. And, you know, it is precisely of servicing that Hubble has become such a resounding success and has lasted for, you know, double the amount of time of its original projected lifespan. It just celebrated its 28th birthday. I know. I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> that is just truly um, uh, amazing to me. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we have worked you know, so closely with uh, uh, NASA, other NASA centers, with, with astronauts to upgrade the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, to replace uh, instruments, uh, to, to, to allow Hubble to continue working successfully uh, today. Yeah, oh, and uh, um, the I'm glad you you brought up the Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission because it, it was designed to be launched and put up there by the space shuttle. It was also designed to be um, uh, uh, periodically gone up and upgraded, and so it was designed from the beginning to be an a, an upgradable telescope using the space shuttle. And every single time they they went up there with it, they basically gave it it made it an entirely new telescope. What it ended up being after, what it is now, is nowhere near what it started out to be. The cameras and stuff have been completely refurbished, the electronics, the computers, all of it. Uh, so it's a really important part of uh, what we're, you know, with Hubble in particular. But what about those missions that weren't designed from the beginning to be um, serviced? Are, are you guys able to do anything with those kinds of satellites? Absolutely. And, and Tony, you brought up a very, very good point. The Hubble Space Telescope was designed to be serviced um, along with the International Space Station. So these are the only two satellites that were designed this way. However, the vast majority of the satellites that are in space are not designed to be serviceable. So, for example, currently, when a satellite runs out of fuel, or encounters a repairable issue, it is deemed inoperable, and you know, and 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 it's the end of um, its its mission. But we all know that launches are very expensive, and billions of dollars worth of satellites are retired when refueling or repairing could extend their lifetime. And of course, this also contributes to the problem of um, orbital debris and um, space junk. So of course there is a better way, right? So for example, if your car ran into simple issues or ran out of fuel, you wouldn't just throw it away. You would fix it or you'll fill your tank with more gas. So that is what we are trying to do here in satellite servicing projects division changing that paradigm and making robotic satellite servicing a reality. And uh, it, so that's something you're also working on, Al, right? Your company 
I mean, I guess this is something where, you know, you hear a lot about SpaceX being out there trying to launch, you know, getting launch vehicles, launching things to supply the space station. Uh, but there's a real opportunity here for robotic servicing uh, of uh, repairing things that are already up there. Is that something your company is looking at doing? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, right now in geostationary orbit, where we build uh, satellites for international companies to provide telecommunications, uh, there are some 300 commercial satellites already up there operating and could be serviced to some extent, although they weren't designed to be serviced. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, some of the satellites uh, have either a deployment problem or another anomaly or, or failure that uh, could be fixed by robotics, uh, simple robotic activities from outside the spacecraft. So those could be serviced uh, using a, a robotic service or like the ones we're building now uh, with, with technologies that already exist. Uh, there are also satellites up there that, although they didn't have a payload, uh, a certain type of mission or payload on it when it was launched, would benefit from it now. And we are looking at it adding payloads to satellites uh, in geostationary orbits. And those payloads might be communi additional communications uh, payloads or antennas, or it might be other uh, sensors and other uh, missions that uh, can be attached to the satellites that are already up there. Now, that's for satellites that weren't designed to be serviced. Uh, as we go forward, uh, more of our customers are saying, hey, uh, if you can really do servicing on orbit, we'd like to put on a USB port on our satellites and attach uh, payloads more easily, more sophisticated payloads. So the concept of putting up a satellite and saying, hey, that's a 15-year mission satellite, but I, would, I don't know everything that I want to have up there on that satellite yet. And in five years, I might want to attach something simply. So let's put an attachment port on there that will simplify the this, this servicing and the expansion of that satellite. So that's where we're heading right now. Uh, we already have customers that have been public about uh, doing that and uh, have started that uh, process. Where it's ultimately going to go are satellites that are actually assembled in orbit. Uh, we've been constrained by launch fairings. Uh, so all these satellites end up fitting in the launch vehicle. And just about every one fits in a single launch fairing. So you might have a four-meter diameter fairing or a, a, a five-meter diameter fairing and it has to fit in that and survive the launch and survive the acoustics and, and vibration. And oh, once okay. it's up there, that's well, that's what it is for life. Okay, I want to so get back to the, I want to get back to the assembly hour. I, I do because that's an important part. But I just want to, with I want to. But before we get too far along, you may you raise some interesting points. I want to I kind of want to respond to here. One of them is that you're you're talking about doing for satellites that weren't designed to be upgraded turning them into an upgrade giving them upgrades not just repairing them but upgrading them much like what happened to Hubble. Right. and so yep. that's an interesting idea because you can you can launch these satellites as they are what for doing whatever their capabilities are and then if you want to add a usb port later or better yet in some cases a different camera or different instrumentation then you can design robots to go up there and do that kind of that kind of work to the ones that already exist. Well, not not necessarily to the ones that exist, but we are launching satellites about five satellites a year, and in that production for our cust for our commercial customers, we can start adding attachment ports. So the ones that we launched this year are launched with these attachment ports and the full complement of payloads that they need for now. But in five years. They say they'd like these additional payloads attached to their satellite, and those attachment ports are already on the satellite. So it simplifies the expansion of the satellites uh, that are that are up there uh, that we're launching now. Okay, and that and that brings me to what uh, 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 Larry Keese's question, uh, and this will be direct, I think, at you, Shao, because we were talking about Hubble. Uh, Hubble, he's, his question is: um, Hubble was designed to be serviced by humans. Um, does this translate to robotic services? Um, well, the, the, the servicing activities that, uh, that we learned from the Hubble Space Telescope definitely can be transferred to um, robotic servicing. So, for example, as we have um, talked about, I mean, most satellites were not designed to be serviceable, right? So, therefore, servicing them is extremely challenging, which is one of the reasons why we need robots to do it. 
And another reason is that, you know, currently astronauts can only visit a, a, a small part of um, space. So, um, so imagine, you know, two vehicles traveling 16,000 miles per hour in the darkness of space. And, you know, one is the satellite that needs to be serviced. And then the other is a servicer that carries, you know, fuel and hardware that's required for fixing the problem. And the, 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 the satellite that needs to be serviced doesn't have any sort of marking or, or stickers that make it easy for the servicer to find it and, and to catch it. So the servicing satellite will have to first find it, catch it, grasp it, rendezvous, and then add in the time uh, delays that it takes to send commands from the Earth to space I mean, the conditions are basically impossible to do it without autonomy and without robots. So we have an, uh, a, a mission called Restore L, and it's going to target the vast majority of satellites that were not designed to be serviced. Uh, so Restore L will have like specialized technologies um, that would um, essentially um, aid in executing um, a servicing mission. <clears throat> Okay, and this and Ro, and and Restore L is a more generic sort of framework for being able to make these missions, right? There'd be like a it's kind of like a template for whatever you need. Then Restore L can be made made to fit a given mission parameter. So let, let me yeah, let me talk about Restore L a little bit. So Restore L is a free flying spacecraft, right? So it's going to contain specialized technology. Uh, to, to be able to execute a servicing mission. Um, so uh, th this, is, this mission will advance some of the technologies that we are developing uh, to demonstrate the ability to be able to service a client that was not designed to be serviceable. As you mentioned with okay. Hubble, it was designed to be serviceable, but how do you service the majority of the satellites that are in orbit that are not designed to be serviceable. Got so it. that is challenging, right? So, 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 so this is, this is how the mission is going to work. So the servicer is going to launch uh, to about like 10 kilometers to the client and then using the suite of technologies that we have developed, the servicer was going to have to rendezvous with the client, grasp it, birth it, and then refuel it. And the client that Restore is going to refuel is Landsat 7 that um, is currently in orbit and will be running out of fuel. So this mission will demonstrate for the very first time how a satellite will rendezvous with uh, a, a satellite that was not designed to be serviced and to be able to refuel it in orbit that is so great so when what what's the timeline for this what when when's this supposed to happen nominally um we are looking in the time frame of the early 2020s um launch date okay boy 2020 is going to be a great decade uh yeah. for so many <laughs> <Very> reasons <exciting. laughs> all right well i want to leave the topic of repairing but before i do you've got me thinking about this i just gotta ask everybody has heard that the Kepler K2 mission is running out of hydrazine. It's sitting in an orbit. I know it's far away uh, from Earth. It's not in Earth orbit. Uh, any chance somebody could get some hydrazine out to Kepler? Theoretically, let's not say that people want to do it. I mean, we got Tess up there now. Tess is doing Kepler's job, or is the successor to uh, Kepler. Uh, but I don't know. Is something like that possible? I would. I just did a... I mean, NASA's got it in sleep mode right now because they've got a couple more firings left to turn it back to Earth and get the data off, and then maybe they can do another campaign, maybe not. Uh, but theoretically, could something like Restore L go out to Kepler and give it some fuel? Um, so <laughs> or, is, or, is, or is Restore L only for things in Earth orbit? Uh, let, let me let me let me suggest that Restore L is intended for a specific demonstration. Uh, there there are uh, commercial companies who are looking at translating that kind of capability to doing just that. Okay, uh, all right. So for, it's a it's a for, for pathfinder. The, for, the, for yeah, for the right business case, uh, that uh, the technologies could be applied to uh, many satellites that are in orbit, including uh, ones that are even outside of Earth orbit. 
Man, that would be great. That's also re- reassuring to know in this era of JWST anxiety, at least it's possible maybe to, uh, to, uh, um, repair things that weren't designed to be repaired. Okay. Well, let's go, let's go from the repair. Tony, can I, can I, um, can I, uh, answer that? So, you? so in terms of servicing, right? So a- anything is, is certainly possible, correct? Um, however, <laughs> I like the way you think. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but we certainly need time to be able to, to, to test it. And, and to do these demonstration missions that would allow us to be able to complete these larger missions successfully in the future. Okay, I can understand that that you need a a a, a, demo, a, a technology demonstrator. We did they did that with Lisa Pathfinder. They tested the technology on Lisa with a with a test instrument. Uh, and I also, to what extent though, can you design a a mission vehicle or robot to be as multi use as possible? I mean, this is designed apparently according to what Al just said for doing the one satellite. Um, what was it again? What was the, what was the satellite? Landsat. Landsat, okay. Landsat 7. Landsat 7, okay. Uh, is there a way to design these things such that, is, are there plans to design these such that they are as um, flexible as possible? I, I think that, that ventures into uh, the tools, just like you would in a, in a tool shop. Um, you, you might have a, a, ra- a ratchet set, but uh, you have different size ratchets or different crescent wrenches or different pliers for different jobs. So depending on what the task at hand is, it's, it's not the robotic arm as much as the tools that might be uh, specialized for each, um, each satellite. And, and even refueling, uh, there are different propellants, but there are also different fill drain valves. So you have to have the right tool for the fill drain valve. And there's different types of uh, pressurized systems. So there, there are some specialty. It isn't so much that you have to have a totally different uh, satellite. For example, the rendezvous and proximity operations, the way it approaches and docks, might be very, very uh, much the same. But when you get there, how you actually access and, and open the fill drain valve might be unique for each one and that's where the tools come in you bring up an interesting point i I guess i do you guys may not know the answer to this and it's fine if you don't uh but to what extent are satellites being designed with any kind of um uh, consistency like you mentioned valves might be different so one valve that does one thing on a spacecraft might there might be a valve that does the exact same thing on another one but the shape of it is different is there any continuity and design among satellites if you don't know the answer to that that's fine i'm just curious about that well i I, from from our commercial business and our commercial satellite servicing business especially we've taken a close look at that for the geostationary uh, orbiting satellites and there there it isn't uh, they aren't all using the same valves and you we have to recognize that so different size tools have to be considered but it's a finite set of uh, different uh, valves that are being used. So we know which ones have which valves, and uh, we can take up the different tools, or for the ones that we want to be able to service, we could take up the right tools. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's just like a repair man going out to uh, repair Maytag or you know, Kenmore or uh, uh, Whirlpool. He takes the you know, parts and tools for the specific one, and those might all be made by the same company now. I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, that okay. That reminded me of of going out to my car and wondering, do I need the metric uh, metric wrench set or do I need the SAE one? And, and exactly, yeah, it's, exactly. It's much worse. Okay. I'm sure. Now, I'm so glad you guys brought up the example of the tools and uh, the valve. So, so we talked about um, satellites that were not designed to be serviceable. However, wouldn't it much easier if we design satellites in the future? to make them more easily accessible and, and, and more serviceable so that robots can be able to do it easier. So we are you know, developing um, some cooperative servicing aids that will allow servicing to be easier in the future. So for example, um, by simply adding fiducials or stickers to a satellite, it will make it easier to be serviced. Right. So I'm, I'm sorry. Point. I'm sorry, Shao. Uh, Al, could I get you to maybe mute? Um, there's some background noise coming through. That, actually, is that Shao's paper running across a microphone? Oh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It sounds sound like somebody's rubbing up against the microphone. Oh, I'm not. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm on. I'm on. I'm on mute. Uh, oh, actually. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm okay. Sorry. Oh. 
Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a rustling or something going on as you're as you're talking. I'm sorry to Okay. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Adding like fiducials or stickers to a satellite will make it very um easy to be um serviceable. And then, you know, another example is um, you know, using uh a a a a cooperative servicing valve. So we're developing cooperative servicing valves. I mean, currently um the valves are on most satellites um they are uh they have uh, many different uh caps to it so in order to perform refueling we would need many different types of tools to remove the various valves now if we come up you know if, and we're designing a cooperative servicing valve so that we can make it easy for a robot to be able to um perform the refueling for future um servicing so this will, you know, reduce the steps that it will require uh, to to perform refueling in the future. So we also talked about um, uh, uh, technologies for uh, robots. Um, I know we we mentioned refueling uh, quite a bit. However, we are also working on, you know, specialized five actually five very specialized technologies to enable um, servicing. Autonomous relative navigation system. That's like your um, auto space pilot, where we use sensors, algorithm, processors, all working together to allow Restore to rendezvous safely with the client. And of course, we need servicing avionics, right? Um, in addition to crunching data, I mean, these electronics are going to be able to control the rendezvous and the robotics uh, task. Uh, robotic arms. Uh, we are going to have two robotic arms for the restore mission and the robotic arms will be able to do very small precision tasks such as um, you know removing the valves like I have mentioned but it's also going to be able to grapple onto the satellite to be able to um, uh, perform servicing um, and of course I think Al mentioned earlier Tools. We're going to need tools. The robotic arms will need tools to be able to perform all these uh, 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 multiple servicing uh, tasks. And of course, you know, with uh, refueling, we're going to need to, you know, understand the propellant transfer system, how the system is going to be able to uh, 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 deliver the right amount of fuel um, at the right temperature, pressure, and rate. So it's not it's not all about just refueling. But the servicer will be able to, you know, do inspection uh, when needed, and and then also do repair. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so I want to um, uh, I want to ask a, a question from James Dugan, who's uh, uh, going. Uh, his question is: Will they be artificial? Will there be? Any this has to do with uh, controlling these once they're up there. Uh, will they? Will there be any artificial intelligence? Uh, involved here or will they all be run from a joystick from the ground so currently we don't have artificial intelligence at this point um for the restore mission the rendezvous and the uh grapple uh, portion is going to be done autonomously uh the refueling portion that will be done um telerobotically Okay, and Uncle Bill Druin is asking, uh, in this single-use venue that we're talking about here, does it not make just as much sense for a reaction attitude module to just clamp on permanently? Al, maybe? I think, yeah, I think what he's asking is, uh, why not spend, we're spending all this, or Al, or the taxpayers, Al and Chow and their team are spending a lot of money to do refueling why not just have your we'll restore L or your yeah. robot just attached to the, yeah. uh, the target and would take over the operations at that point? Yeah, yeah. So let, let me just say a few words about that. Uh, th there are some people that are working on that uh, that uh, uh, approach, uh, meaning attaching to and taking over the pointing and orbit control of the satellite, meaning disabling the original satellite thruster systems and uh, attitude control systems and being able to have this attached uh, module uh, conduct that. And, and that's, that's one, uh, one approach being worked. There is a business case to be thought through and considered for refueling. Now, Restore-L is a demonstration mission. It's not intended to be 
um, the uh, life extension of Landsat 7 that's uh, uh, per se, but it's a demonstrating of refueling, and Landsat 7 is the intended um, you know, s- uh, satellite or client. So if a refueling satellite, though, can refuel a dozen, maybe two dozen, or three dozen satellites with its one load of fuel, that can start to become an interesting business case. You can <laughs> add three years of life for 20 or 30 satellites, and the value of doing that, building that one refueling mission can be recouped for commercial business and then some. So that's why, that's why there's pros and cons to both. That's an excellent point. Wow, that's, that's, yeah, that would be a very efficient way to go about and just doing it one launch, multiple refuels. That's really good. Um, now, James Dugan has a question I'm going to add to it. Uh, how do you stop the bolts and screws floating away when you undo them to reuse them on reassembly? And then I'm going to I'm going to uh, expand that question to ask about garbage collection. Is there a way is there any way we can use to get uh some of this junk out of the out of orbit of Earth? But let's start with the nuts and bolts. How, uh, the tools that you were mentioning Al, uh the clamps yeah, and all of that. Sure. How do you stop all this stuff from just sure. making a mess? Sure. Yeah. So there've already been technologies demonstrated by astronauts uh uh that have removed uh, boxes actually on Hubble that uh, w- weren't actually intended to be removed, and hence the the latches and mechanisms weren't uh, didn't have capture uh, systems. But the tools that were taken up did have a capture system for for the uh, screws that were being removed. So um, it can be incorporated in the in the tool itself to extract the screw and capture it. Uh, similarly, uh, you you might see astronauts carry a, a stuff bag or a garbage bag uh, with them that they'll stick uh, things into. And, and it's basically um, uh, like a one-way, you know, uh, a bungee-corded uh, a neck on a, on a bag. So they can uh, stick their hands in, release whatever uh, they need to uh, dispose of, and then pull their hands out and it stays inside. So there, there's definitely thoughts put into how you do uh, things without creating debris and how you uh, manage an operation uh, uh, long-term where you're creating you're, – you're, you know, removing used equipment and removing screws and so forth. Okay. And um, I would like to add to that. So, so NASA, we have uh, a rich history of servicing, you know, certainly going back uh, to Solar Max and then to the Hubble Space Telescope. I remember so, Solar Max. Oh. Yeah, yeah, 1984. <laughs> uh, so, so I want to give an example of um, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission for uh, we discovered that a, a power converter uh, was not working on the STIS instrument. And, you know, our engineers uh, determined exactly where that failure was. So in order to fix that, I mean, you know, the, the astronaut could simply just, you know, pull out that uh, the, the, the power board from the computer and replace that power converter. However, that particular box had 111 fasteners. So imagine disengaging 111 fasteners in orbit, right? So what this team did was to uh, come up with a fastener capture plate that was installed um, on top of, of this electronics box and um, and then we came up with the, with tools to be able to perform this task. So so you know for those of the folks who watch NASCARs and you see how fast they they change the tires, but you know they have nothing on on our astronauts, and and they were able to um, you know disengage all those eleven hundred eleven fasteners and have this fastener capture plate. That would you know capture all these fasteners, um, so that that particular task was done successfully. Um, the the board was pulled out, a new board was put in, and then a new plate was put in, so that the astronaut did not have to you know reengage all those fasteners. So so this team knows how to do servicing, and 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 we know how to capture all the nuts and bolts by the specialized tools that we have been designing going all the way back to the Hubble Space Telescope. 
Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that, the, another thing that occurred to me while you were talking about all those fasteners was I saw the things that John Grunsfeld had to go through with Hubble and uh, and see the the things that had to be unscrewed and the, and one advantage it seems to me over robot from robotics over the, the astronauts doing the work would be fatigue. Uh, you can keep at a hundred and some odd fasteners uh, with a robot, whereas with an astronaut. Uh, you're going to have to, they would get really tired uh, being out there doing all that. I am looking at um, Discord, guys, and I see uh, Professor Master's question. Um, uh, the, Professor Master, she's she's from Haverford College, and she watches these hangouts with her class. And she's got some, she's got a couple of questions here, so let me read them to you. At Haverford, we're curious who the customers are for this service. Is it private communication satellites, or is it the government? So, so I'll, I'll talk about... Uh, I'll talk about what we're doing on the commercial side, and, and uh, you know, Chow can uh, expand on that definitely from a government, uh, NASA and government systems. So uh, our, our commercial servicing business will serve both uh, commercial satellites and government satellites. We're focused on geostationary orbit, where there are roughly 300 commercial geosatellites owned by companies like Intelsat, SES, Utilsat, Telesat. As well as uh, regional operators like AsiaSat, um, a lot of consumer recognizable products like Sirius XM Radio and DirecTV and Dish Network. So there are a lot of commercial companies that own satellites. And just like a commercial company in, on Earth, Surface, would want to maintain and upgrade their uh, infrastructure, uh, these satellite operators want to do the same thing. With that, having been said, with the 300 satellites, there are another 80 or so government-owned satellites in geostationary orbit. NASA has a few um, themselves. Solar Dynamic Observatory is one example. NOAA has a few, the GOES weather satellites. And there's a lot of other uh, international uh, government satellites like those uh, in, in geostationary orbit. The same servicing vehicle that we're building can service both the commercial and government satellites. Okay. And do you, do you want to add to that anything, Chow? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So we are, you know, a, a government agency, NASA. So we, you know, service uh, government owned um, satellites. Um, however, uh, while we're developing all these um, technologies, NASA is also sharing these technologies with uh, interested domestic uh, uh, companies in order to jumpstart a domestic servicing um, uh, industry here. So, you know, this, this would not only bolster the um, domestic economy, but also position the, U the U.S. as a global leader in satellite servicing. Okay, well, that brings us to her follow-on question was, was this, is this only for the U.S. or is it for any international partners as well? Are we looking, is this primarily something we're looking just for us? Yes, this is only for U.S. Um, domestic companies. And here's a good question. I, I really like this one. You know, we were talking about these clamps and these, you know, SAE and metric uh, things. Uh, how will people agree on standards when we can't even can't even agree on paper sizes? That's a comment from Professor Masters. But yeah, <laughs> and that's a good point, right? I mean, it's like you you, you want to build a satellite that is yeah. as cheap as possible. But if you're going to build yeah. in any kind of rebuildability, uh, repairability, or expandability, you're going to have to think about this stuff, right? I mean, that's what made yeah. the Apple II Plus yeah. a better computer than the Commodore 64, as I date yeah. myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a very, very fair question. And, and as I mentioned, we, we actually build commercial satellites ourselves, and, and we recognize what influences us to go with the design. And, and it, it, oftentimes it's, it's business motivations and not – uh, international standards or, or norms. Um, but having said that, that's because historically there just hasn't been servicing as an option. A as that becomes more and more valuable to do, I think our customers will you know, gravitate towards that. But so far it hasn't. So what that leaves us with is for right now, we will have to carry multiple sets of tools or instead of carrying you know, five different sockets for a socket wrench, we'll carry a, a crescent wrench and work with that. So there's just, uh, in the interim, there's just things that we have to work around. Okay. Uh, and, and I'd like to add to that too. Mm -hmm. So, so the, you know, so the first people who are developing these technologies for, uh, service, for servicing, I mean, should be the people who are establishing the standard because, you know, these are the folks that are, you know, going to prove that this is, this is going to work and that this makes sense. And then the others will follow suit. Right. Okay. 
Uh, okay, we've talked about repairs and we've talked about you know getting uh, uh, some some um, some of the stuff that, that you know the the history of robotics and space things like that. Let's go to let's look to the future about th- you you brought this up out toward the beginning and I stopped you because I wanted to get to it later uh, about this idea. We've got a rocket like things like the Ariane five, the Ariane six coming up. Uh, we've got the various SLS. I think we've got the various SLS rockets. I don't know what's happening with that anymore. Uh, and of course SpaceX is doing things. We have these finite sizes to fit things in what where are you guys looking what are you guys thinking about with uh launching multiple things and then putting them together in space yeah yeah this is actually one of the most exciting parts of having robotics in space the opportunity to actually realize what people have only seen in in sci-fi movies so anything that you've seen in a movie pretty much could not fit in a fairing uh any kind of structure bigger than you know 10 meters type of dimensions are just too difficult to fold and to expand. Uh, Some of the most complex uh, satellites that we've built had to still fold up and uh, fit in a a four or five meter fairing. So what we're looking at in the future is the ability to do not only assembly in space, but manufacturing and assembly in space. And this means the potential to build out uh, not a, a single satellite, but you can think of it as an antenna tower with different antennas mounted on it and power being provided to it. And when we need, we install additional antennas, not just replace the whole tower. This starts to head down the path of, well, uh, you know, dimensions are unlimited. Uh, Antennas can be, you know, 15, 20 meters uh, on uh, diameter. And uh, that starts to create new markets. Uh, You're not just serving the existing markets uh, uh, that, satellites have served, but you can now do things that you couldn't do with a four meter uh, antenna that you were constrained to before. So those are starting to head down and that's the direction that we're heading down. Um, And there's a lot of technology that's already available and uh, some interesting programs that we've already started, uh, but there's a lot more that uh, we'll be able to do. And for NASA's part, the uh, return to the moon with the gateway uh, is an exciting element of how they're going to assemble the next des- human destination as well. So there, there's going to be another opportunity to demonstrate uh, in-orbit assembly. And- Absolutely. Gateway to the moon and then, you know, like NASA missions such as, you know, Journey to Mars. I mean, you know, all these exciting uh, 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 larger uh, missions and you know, we, you know, we talk about you know the the, the exciting part, the possibility of, of finding life on another planet. That means we will most likely need a, a, a much larger telescope, much larger than the Hubble Space Telescope, much larger than mm-hmm. the um, James Webb Telescope. So we're looking at you know possibly a, a thirty meter uh, a telescope in the future. And as you uh, both have mentioned that currently we are limited by the size of the satellites we can uh, uh, launch because of their ability to be able to fit into a rocket and and having um, the ability to do assembly in space will definitely uh, help us reach these future uh, potential for 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 these potential future missions to to search for life outside of our planet. So the technologies that we are developing currently, um, you know, things like relative navigation system that's going to help us uh, find, locate, grapple other objects in space. Um, and 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 this will make in space assembly in the future um, certainly a, a possibility. Yeah. Now, Harley, this might be something you could comment on as well. I mean, we know we've talked before about some of the future space telescopes that are coming up. I think JWST pretty much is the limit. We can cram something into a to a, ro- uh, a rocket and, and then maybe unfold it using some complicated origami. But uh, are the future we've talked we've had hangouts in the past on some of the future space telescopes. Are these being designed, do you know, uh, with this sort of assembly in space uh, option? Uh, uh- no, not not yet. Um, quite sensibly, our colleagues and and Xiao and Al know know this as well. Our colleagues who are working on the post JWST missions are working first to see how much aperture, if you will, 
um, they can cram into the upper stage fairing. That's the hollow pointy, in case folks don't know, the hollow pointy part of the, of the launch vehicle um, that will self-deploy, that won't need uh, external robotic assistance, but will self-deploy. And the estimates are sort of in the neighborhood of, of, of oh, 12, 13, 14 meters in diameter, roughly speaking about twice the aperture of JWST. Um, however, astronomers, uh, because so much of the universe is extremely far away and therefore faint, that's very annoying. Will continue. Will continue and going away. Will continue <laughs> to look for larger apertures. Still, given that force JWST type self deployment out of the out of the fairing, um, we've got to start looking at at something else. We've got to start looking very seriously at at assembly. So there is, uh, and, and Xiao and Al and others have been involved in a number of workshops and early versions of what we call trade studies, looking at various alternatives. Early days yet, but um, assembly of post-JWST or post-post-JWST observatories is, is a growing possibility with increasing interest uh, in folks like myself and Shao and Al. Okay. Uh, let me uh, get to a couple of OnePlot's questions. He's got some good ones here. OnePlot's asking, if you could refuel and reservice satellites, what time, what type of life expectancy could this allow for these satellites? It's a good question. Pretty much the sky's the limit, isn't it? As long as you can keep repairing them. Okay. Yeah, uh, very, very good question. And, and uh, what we find is uh, right now we build satellites, uh, commercial satellites that last 15 years. They're designed and contracted to, to last 15 years. Uh, oftentimes at the end of 15 years, our customers want to keep operating them. Even if they're in a reduced capacity mode, they will keep wanting to operate them. So we've had uh, satellites last over 30 years now um in in in, uh, in geostationary orbit and uh so there are other things that get depleted though there, it is a harsh radiation environment uh solar arrays get uh, degraded uh there's a lot of electronics in our satellites and those get degraded by radiation and, and thermal cycling so eventually there are uh, components that uh, will make it not practical and not economical to refuel and continue operating the satellite yeah that's a good, yeah. So there's just some parts you won't be able to repair. There's a core component somewhere that's just going to define the life of that satellite, whatever that's it right. might be. Yeah. That's um, right. And what uh, he's also asking, what about inflatable structures? I think that's a little bit different than what we're talking about, though. But do you got? I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you have a comment on inflatable structures? Uh, I'll make a quick comment that um, Bigelow, uh, you know, put up a habitat. It's not inflatable, but it's expandable. Uh, meaning that it's a uh, it's a mesh type material uh, for a habitat that was uh, uh, launched and expanded into a large volume and attached to uh, you know attached to the space station. So there are some um, um, structures like that. I know there are are inflatable uh, antenna uh, reflectors that are being developed, um, but there are also uh, 3D printed structures that are being looked at. And uh, the potential to take up a bag of pulp and print out whatever structure that you'd like is being looked at. So that's pretty exciting, too. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a good point. The 3D printers are making a huge uh, splash, uh, so to speak, in space. That's great. Larry Keys is asking, would it be possible to make LIGO supersized? Look, it would. Be, LIGO is already supersized, Larry. Have you seen <laughs> just how big? What was it like? Fifty thousand kilometers between nodes. I mean, that thing is going to be huge. So I think that was, that's Lisa. L Ligo is the oh Ligo oh Ligo. That's uh, that, sorry. I thought I read Lisa and it said Ligo. Legos. Lego Make, Legos. Legos. <laughs> Legos. Legos. Super size. Ligo is ground based. Sorry, I th I saw Lisa and and went. Uh, remember that was one of our big uh, coups. We had the we had the gravitational wave. That's right. They were on our hangout. That was a lot of fun. Years ago. Yes, we need to do more gravitationally wavy things so um yes uh so early days maybe but or this is from john yogurst i think uh so early days maybe but who has actually done robotic who has actually done robotic assembly not unfolding but done it not human hands mere iss hubble okay he wants to know where robotic demos are actually expected when question mark no, I think that's what uh, Restore L is supposed to be about, right? Uh, 
Right. Um, right. So uh, we also have um, a, a, a couple of payloads on the International Space Station, uh, the robotic refueling mission uh, in three phases. We have completed um, phases one and two and phase three will be launched um, on SpaceX 16 in November of this year. This is very exciting. So the robotic refueling mission three um, it's going to demonstrate that uh, we are going to be able to do refueling uh, in, in orbit. Uh, so, so RM3 um, developed technologies and, and capabilities uh, to, to, facilitate, to facilitate robotic servicing. Um, uh, and, and, and it's going to demonstrate uh, methods such as storing, transferring, um, and freezing cryogenic fluid in, in orbit. So we're very excited um, about that. Um, for the previous two missions, the RM1 and 2, we demonstrated uh, using the various tools. So we did use robots uh, uh, you know, to, to perform various tasks, such as cutting wires um, and also uh, uh, disassembling some of the valves. And uh, we also did transfer, I think it was 1.6 liter of, of ethanol. So we're, so we're taking, you know, steps um, before reaching the, the, the big jobs such as refueling um, on Restore. So we, we have demonstrated that, uh, uh, you know, small steps in refueling on RM. All right, there you go, John. Good. Uh, uh Let's see. Uh, Andrew Planet's got a good question. Hi, Andrew. It's good to see you again. Uh, is it possible to weld in outer space? So I, I know that NASA Marshall has been working on different manufacturing processes for in-space uh, manufacturing, and I believe well, a form of welding, and I won't know the exact uh, type, but uh, you could probably look it up. A form of welding in space has been looked at by NASA Marshall. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, you'd probably you probably need arc welding. There's commenting uh, on here as well, or something that doesn't require oxygen. I assume. I assume. Uh, Dark time on uh, Discord is asking: Aren't the electronics of communication satellites aging with Moore's law? Isn't it more valuable to replace the electronics than to refuel satellites? Like the Hubble has been upgraded. Is it more? Does it make a better business case? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And that's the motivation for doing what I described earlier. There's um, a lot of interest in actually um, building satellites that are modular and can be upgraded over time. You know, a lot of what we put up, uh, the mass that we launch, uh, doesn't deplete uh, very quickly. The structure, the large uh, thermal radiators, the, uh, you know, the, the reaction wheels and electronics, do uh, degrade and if you can make it modular enough to replace them and then continue to use the same antennas and structure um it could be very economical so it isn't the refueling isn't the end game it's just the easiest right now to implement with the satellites that are up there and ultimately we do want to make satellites build them and design them to be modular and take advantage of moore's law and the changing e economy only 11 years ago, iPhones started coming out. Who knew that, that when we were launching a satellite that lasts 15 years, that uh, you know uh, iPhones would be in everyone's hands, and that's the way people want to communicate. So, yes, we do want to make them modular enough to respond to the market and to Moore's Law. Yeah, I mean, in a, in, a, in a way, Hubble benefited from that, right? We were able each time, because when it was first launched in 1990, it had to depend on detectors that were in common use, because things have to be space certified before they can be used so you can't always get the latest and greatest detectors uh right as they're invented you have to wait for them to become proven and so hubble was using detectors that were many years behind uh when it was first launched but then, then of course as it was up there new technology came up when they were able to increase those cameras so that goes back to the modularity design of hubble uh which had its limits but we were able to overcome some of those so um uh Okay, Absolutely. so can I, Tony, can I add to that? You so, sure may. so in, in, in looking at future uh, uh, satellites, um, in, in, in looking at the architecture, you know, including modularity in the design will make 
it's so much easier to be able to replace, you know, um, a detector like you mentioned, or or an electronics box. I mean, just like we have done with Hubble with all the uh, various instrument, and you know, on Hubble we even uh, replace the power control unit, which is the heart of the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, with all the electronics that um, that that drove the Hubble Space Telescope. So yes, certainly, you know, in in looking at you know future. Uh, satellites incorporating modularity in the spacecraft design will enable servicing in the future. Right, from the start. Okay, Absolutely. so uh, Harley, you need to hold up your sign. Hold up your sign for us. The, the one that's behind you. We see your well, kitty. We see your cat. Well, yes, my, hold it up for us. Bo- my cat bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I really do bottom need. Bottom of one of my cats. Um Okay. Yeah, actually, and just sort of a, a political note here. Um, in addition to servicing and repairing and upgrading, being, as as our two guests have have described very, very effectively, um, a, a very useful and I think it's going to be increasingly widely applied. Um, NASA is also legally required now to build its uh, medium and large space uh, facilities. It's space science facilities to be serviced. Really? Oh, that's good to know. Oh, I did not know that. That's great. Um, That's been about about eight years. Okay, good. Uh, Well, I want to end the hangout. We're running out of time. I want to end the hangout with uh, uh, Condor Boss's question, and it's one that is near and dear to, I think, everybody out here's heart. We've talked about Hubble many times. Hubble has been mentioned. Is there any thought... Is there any plans, maybe? Because they put that little rope, that re- wheel on the bottom of it. Remember that little grabber thing? Uh, is there any thought being given to a robotic repair to extend Hubble's life at all? Or is it just too expensive? Anyone? Is, it, is NASA thinking about this in any way? Um, currently, there there is no more plan for a servicing mission for the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so for what for those of you who don't know, what they did as part of the last servicing mission, among a great many other things, was they also put a little ring on the bottom of the spacecraft. You can see it in photos. Oh, that's designed. Hopefully, it's just something to grab onto. That's all it is. <laughs> and maybe with the hope, I, th- I think I love it when NASA does this. They do little things like this that maybe okay. So the chances aren't great, but you know what? It's no big deal to put this on there. Let's just put a ring on the bottom. They did it with Voyager. You know what? It's no big deal to put a little gold record on the side. Let's just do it. And who knows? Maybe somebody will find it. I love it when they, the little touches like that, I just think is really cool that they do that. But it's possible. Right, so, so the Hubble Space, I'm sorry, Harley. So the Hubble Space Telescope, um, it's, it's, it's the Mormon ring. And um, so Landsat 7 also has a Mormon ring. And that is, you know, the ring that the robot is going to grapple on to. Uh, for uh, with with restore. So in fu- in the future, if if future satellites would have like grapple fixture, um, it would make it you know so much easier for 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 robot for the robotic arm to to grab onto the uh, the, the satellites. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Galaxy is also asking, and I we talked about Kepler a little bit, but I don't think so is the answer to your question, Galaxy. But I'll ask it anyway. Do you guys have any plans of sending re- any reaction wheels to Kepler? No, uh, uh, there are there are no plans. Also, Kepler is um, Kepler has been a terrific mission. It's been a terribly yeah. exciting mission. There are other missions that will probably more suitable, and the Kepler's orbit is a really dynamically a really inaccessible. Orbit. Yeah, it's sitting about a million miles away. I think ahead of us in our orbit around the sun, and we follow behind it as we travel in our uh, orbit. So, um, yeah, I think it's both too far away, and as you mentioned, uh, Harley. Tess is up there now, and we've got other planet-finding telescopes that will hopefully do a lot better job than Kepler did, although Kepler has changed the way we looked at the universe. Yep. No question yep. about Perfect it. Mission. Okay, very good. Um, well, I want to thank... Okay, well, that's it for today, guys. I want to thank my um, my guests, uh, uh, Dr. Shao Smith from uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, also Al Tadros from SSL, the company that is working on getting more... Uh, more uh, commercially involved in not just repairing satellites that are already up there, which I get, I think I, that's a really good business model. I'm glad someone's thinking about this mm-hmm. as well. We didn't even get to talk about mining, but I'm sure that somebody, somebody's thinking about that somewhere, but assembling things in space, uh, once they've been launched, robots have a huge role 
to play in the future of human spaceflight. I wanted to ask the question of why do we even need humans in space? But then, of course, we all know the answer. Of course, we need humans in space. But you know, they're never going to replace humans, but they are valuable. Uh, and and so NASA's thinking about this. Private companies are thinking about this, folks. So we've got a bright. We've lived in, we've lived in the, in the golden age of astronomy for the past I don't know at least twenty years. I call it the golden age anyway. And it's just so many things we've learned about the universe. Well, we're starting to embark now with commercial commercial companies and and other countries starting to develop space programs human spaceflight is starting to enter a golden age i think a new golden age so lots of things to look forward to i want to thank my guests very much also thank you harley for setting these up i think uh next time are we doing a hangout on gateway or no is that not uh, uh, the gateway the human habitation and operation system and proposed for orbit around in the vicinity of the moon is up uh, in the very near future. Yeah, okay. Uh, you are posting on your website. You're posting right. the upcoming schedule. Yes, yeah. and as they get as they get more and more details, I will upgrade the the calendar on deepastronomy dot space slash hangouts also i would invite you guys if you want to learn about new content on deep astronomy just register your email address that's all you got to do click on notify me when new stuff gets posted and you'll get a new notification when we go live when a new video is posted a new article whatever so that's a good way to learn about what's coming up um okay so that is uh that is it for this time around guys next week we will be back with carol christian uh on Ast astronomy coffee hangout where we will be talking about whether or not climate change could be a great filter. And if you're interested in Fermi's Paradox, you'll want to check this out. All right, folks, that's it for this time. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. <laughs> oh, I didn't have you up. Do it again. <laughs> there you go. Gravitational rubber ducky. Okay. <laughs> that's a gravitational rubber ducky. All right. Bye, guys. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thank you, Bye Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.